In 2007, the government of Pakistan announced 2007 as year of uh, Pakistan tourism. So, you know, it was one wonderful uh, site on Lonely Planet Guide. Uh, you know, there is macroeconomic development. Uh, the president says there are, there are X number of mobile phones available. Uh, the, the economy is working. It's progressive. It's all what one would want in, in, in a middle-income country. But within 12 months, and I'm talking, uh, you know, end of 2007, beginning of 2008, Suddenly, Pakistan becomes the most dangerous destination on the planet. Uh, there is this 180 degree shift. How does it happen? But I think that's not the important issue. The more important issue is that there is so much text it, in between these two black and white lines, between the wonderful destination and the most dangerous destination. There is a lot of text. What is happening? What has happened? I mean, whenever you declare, whenever the government in the United States, whenever the government anywhere in the world, or the government in Pakistan, makes these declarations, there is always so much more that is hidden behind those, those declarations. And my book, Military Inc. is really about that other side. It brings that alternative pers perspective. It questions uh, some of these declarations. See, if government of Pakistan will stop playing at numbers for a minute and start thinking deeply about what is the state of poverty, the issue is not whether the poverty, uh, you know, people living uh, below poverty line are 36% or more, whether there is a difference of 3% here or 3% there. The issue is that you have a large number of people who are never represented in the current discourse on Pakistani politics. Uh, the problem, in fact, with this whole issue of the war on terror is that it hides more than it discloses. And what it definitely hides is the state of the people. The state of the people who do not have access to a lot of facilities that we basically take for granted uh, in the rest of the world or even within Pakistan. For example, in, in, for, the, for the past 50 days, people in Parachanar, that is up in, 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 uh, in, in the northern areas in Pakistan, do not have electri electricity. There are wheat shortages, there are sugar shortages, and this is not just a temporary crisis. This is reflective of how resources are distributed generally. And I'm talking here about the young man, the 20-year-old, who does not dream about going to university, who does not dream about you know, a reasonable school, college education, but who is then tempted to go and join the jihadis to fight, to become a martyr. And this is not just an issue of ideology. It's also a peculiar dimension of how poverty has developed or how the issue of poverty has, been not, has not been addressed. I'm not going to uh, get into the details of that discussion. Probably we'll deal with it in, in uh, Q&A. But that extremism is, is, an, is uh, the, the spin-off of, of that lack of consideration or, or a spin-off of a lack of attention to this vital issue of how resources are to be more evenly distributed is one of the spin-off is, is the extremism that we get to hear about. Now, of course, one of the questions which you, know, you might have in your mind right now is what has military economy got to do with it? Am I about to propose that military is the worst institution or military, is the only, are the military men are the only good bad guys? No, that's not the case. And this is not the argument of my book at all. 
See, when I started to look at the issue of how resources are distributed and how institutions, uh, what is the state of institutions in Pakistan? Because the nature of institutional uh, relationships, institutional development, institutional uh, balance or imbalance is very critical to how resources are distributed. And you know, you naturally figure out that yes, military has emerged as the, one of the most powerful institutions. I mean, you come to the United States and what you constantly hear is, uh, you know, by the educated Pakistanis, by the Americans, by, by edu even by educated Pakistanis at home, that why even talk about the military? Because it's the most, it's the only institution left in the country. But one definitely needs to look at this institution uh, to at least critically examine <clears throat> what it's capable of doing, what it has done to itself, and, and uh, how does it impact the relationship between the state and the society. So military economy is not just about the military. Military economy that I'm looking at is part of a larger elite economy. See, once you start looking at military economy uh, as we have traditionally looked at it, which is what comes under the defense budget, yes, Pakistani defense budget is a single line figure. We do not know the details. The parliament, it's not discussed in the parliament. It's precisely like Turkey where, you know, uh, you cannot discuss the military budget. But is that all that we have? You start, it, start looking into figures, you start looking into uh, the resources which military uses, and you find out that actually the resources which are being used are much more than what is even given in that single line figure. For example, military economy that I would like to talk about today, and which I've discussed in my book, is not 3.5 or 3.6% of the GDP, it's much more. It's, it would be a conservative estimate, it would be over, over 7%. So what's happening? More than that, <coughs> as I said, this is, this is an extremely elitist economy. Uh, and it is reflective of how resources are distributed. And how resources have been distributed, and what is, the, what is the politics of that resource distribution. Let me quickly define what military economy am I looking at. This is the military economy or military capital that I have looked at in my book is beyond the defense budget. It is something which you find in, uh, in all major countries of the world, including the United States. It is a product of the expansion of the security sector on one hand, and also the lack of transparency of what all the security sector does. You have a lot of economic functions which benefit the military directly and indirectly, and it's not just the military, it's the military fraternity, what I call the military fraternity, which means serving military, retired military, and certain members of the civilian community who are directly who directly benefit from, uh, you know, from the military capital. So the beneficiaries, and because of legal and extra legal uh, mechanisms, it is always, it does not fall in the purview of public sector accountability procedures. So to give an example, Halliburton would not come under the purview of uh, public sector accountability measures here in the United States. Uh, in China, Pakistan, uh, Myanmar, Burma, uh, Thailand, and other countries, there will be extra legal measures to keep this economy out of the purview of uh, public sector accountability. Now, and, and this is what I had focused on, and the term I use for it is milbiz, uh, you know, uh, which, which is a combination of military and business. It is not just the corporate activities of the military, but this is something which militaries do uh, in terms of profit making. And therefore, you know, the term business, but it's much broader than just uh, corporate activities. Let me quickly give you the example of, of, of Pakistan. See, Pakistani 
military economy has three tiers. The first tier and the third tier are actually very intransparent. The first tier is where the organization is involved uh, directly into corporate ventures. And this is a segment which I call uh, small and medium uh, enterprise uh, operations or the cooperative type of operations. So you have the military involved in, I mean, there are hundreds of projects that they do, uh, ranging from bakeries to gas stations to uh, you know, even uh, beauty parlors uh, in some cases. And this is the same in, 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 for example, in China's case. There have been instances when military has, uh, has imposed uh, taxes on national highways completely illegally. The law stipulates that they cannot do it. Yet, because of their power and authority, they have done it. It's very difficult. These, it's, these, these operations are run into hundreds. They're very difficult to quantify uh, because they completely depend on state assets on the defense budget. And if there is the secrecy, if uh, the military is intransparent, if the defense budget is intransparent, then you probably cannot uh, evaluate, uh, you know, what is, is uh, you know, what is being, uh, what is the value of these operations. Uh, but they're definitely <clears throat> claiming uh, important state resources. Then there is a second level, which is called, which I call the subsidiaries. And these subsidiaries are five military foundations, all controlled by the military. Now, what the military claims in Pakistan is that these foundations, which is the first is the Fauji Foundation. Fauji means uh, a soldier. Fauji Foundation, which is basically a tri-service organization. Then you have the Army the Welfare Trust. Then you have the Shaheen Foundation, which is the Air Force's uh, welfare operation. Then you have Behria Foundation, which is the Navy's. And then finally, you have the Pakistan Ordnance Factories Foundation. Now, between these found five foundations, they run over 100 huge projects. And to give an example, uh, but in these five foundations uh, the, the, uh, are into heavy manufacturing. In fact, they control one third of heavy manufacturing uh, in, in, in Pakistan. Uh, they're into cement production, fertilizer production, they make cereals, they make, uh, they're into education, they're into, uh, they have run universities, colleges, schools. Uh, they, they're into finance, they have, they have a, there's a military operated bank as you have in Thailand uh, and a couple of other places. Uh, they are into insurance, they're into, uh, you know, uh, medical care, they're into a lot of fields. And this is the most transparent segment of Milbiz, uh, because very few of these corporations are listed uh, on the stock exchange, and therefore you, you have access to some data. Not all are listed. Not all 100 projects are listed uh, on the stock exchange. Then you have a third level, which is the level of the individuals. And that is where the game becomes even more interesting. Uh, because there you see uh, new concepts being constantly developed. Uh, the organization, which is the, the armed forces, the, the, the armed forces, the institution of the armed forces, uses its authority uh, and credibility to bring benefits to its individual uh, officers and officials. And so you have a situation, for example, that a new class of military agriculturists uh, develops. The military controls, for example, the military in Pakistan controls 11.58 uh, million acres, which is 12% of uh, total state land. Uh, not the whole of Pakistan, but state land. State land is about 93 million acres. 
Now, out of that 11.58 million acres, 6.9 million acres is agricultural land, and about 6 million acres have been distributed since 1960s amongst individuals. Uh, at, at not even throwaway prices. Uh, you know, those prices are, are absolutely comical. Uh, <clears throat> and there is no control, no uh, control over the further sale of, of, uh, of these lands. It's not just the agricultural land. Military personnel, especially the officer guard, has been given uh, land in, in, in uh, urban centers as well. And I grew up in a city uh, of Lahore, uh, and this was the Lahore cantonment. In fact, my, my parents had, had bought the land for uh, building a house there from a military general. So, you know, as civilians, we could go and buy a house in a, <clears throat> in a, in a military cantonment. In years, and, and you know, I grew up seeing uh, infantry exercise grounds uh, around me, uh, shooting ranges and all of that, you know, which military uses for its army, uses for its training. 10, 15 years down the line, it's gone. They're all housing schemes. They're all, uh, you know, big real estate ventures. And the beneficiaries are the officer cadre of, of the armed forces. That's just one of the many benefits that individuals have. Then military officers, especially the top ranking guys, use their contacts in the organizations. And, and the organization's political power is essential in building their, their strength uh, as entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm sure some of them would be you know, really wonderful entrepreneurs, great ideas, but it's my hunches it's not just that. It's not just that they are brilliant businessmen, but they depend on uh, the power of, of, of their institution to get them, uh, you know, to generate that influence and to generate enough, uh, you know, uh, enough influence which, you know, which, which helps them build their uh, amazing businesses. Then you have uh, military in civilian positions as well in public sector de departments and private sector departments. There is an essential role which retired officers play for their organizations. They are the main contacts point, they become conduit in, in this larger military economy. So what really has happened in, since 1954? 1954 is when the first military foundation was opened, was started. Since 1954, what you have had is building up, a gradual building up, and, 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 and gradual and systematic building up of military's clout as an organization. And not just that, building up of the clout of military as an independent class as well. And that is what then comes and links up with the rest of the elite structure of the economy. Pakistan's political system is, is Praetorian, it, is, it has been that. And one of the problems of Praetorianism is, you know, the way it has been defined in literature, is that the lack of a neutral arbiter to negotiate conflict within uh, the different political stakeholders. And therefore, the military or the bureaucracy is seen as an institution which can play the role of a neutral arbiter. The problem with the military turning into a class is that it does, it no longer remains neutral to the process of uh, adjudicating or arbitrating between different stakeholders because it has definite interests as well. Let me give you an example. Pakistan has about 20 million landless peasants. We've had two failed attempts at land reforms, one by General Ayub Khan during the 1960s and another by Zulfikar Ali Bhutto in the 1970s. Yet, uh, two issues here. One issue is that you know, these gentlemen were never 
completely honest in <clears throat> carrying out uh, the land reforms which would change the structure of socioeconomic redistribution in the society. But I think you know, that, is, that, is, uh, that is secondary. What is more important is that the land which was eventually, which, you know, which, which was, uh, you know, which was surrendered by some and which to the state, never really got redistributed. It's, it, it, it is there with the state of Pakistan. The only system of redistribution of land, especially agricultural land that you have in the country, really is what the state gives to its, uh, to its military, to its military officials and officers, in particularly officers. There are differences within that distribution system as well. I mean, the military claims there is a system of merit, uh, and you know, agricultural land is distributed both to soldiers and the officers. But the fact is that, one, soldiers do not get uh, as much land as the officer. The, the soldiers get about 12 to 12 and a half acres. Good, good old days, generals used to get something like 263. Uh, these days, when you know, probably there is deficiency, and the, the, the pool of soldiers is also increased. Uh, soldiers get, uh, officers get 50 acres. But not just that. I mean, if you happen to be a senior officer, uh, I wish we had um, multimedia today. I had brought some photographs with me. You have, you know, to show you some of, you know, these were pictures of the farmlands of senior generals. Uh, the land is guarded by paramilitary uh, troops, which is paid by, by uh, the taxpayers of Pakistan. Uh, they get huge subsidies. Farm to market road, water. <clears throat> this is something which the landless peasant or the small farmer does not get access to. And so, in reality, there is no difference between the new agriculturist, the general or the senior officer, and the local feudal uh, who's already there, traditionally there. In fact, there is that bond developing between the two. For example, I mean, I'll give you an example. General Musharraf has 50 acres or more of land in Bahawalpur. I do not see his son, Bilal Musharraf, leaving Stanford or Boston, wherever he is in the United States, uh, to go and till the soil there, to live in the land. You know, he'll eventually probably sell it. Question is, who does he sell it to? Whoever can offer the better price. Uh, and that is what strengthens uh, the local feudal landowner there. In fact, what has happened in the past 15, 20 years is that the whole issue of land reform has completely gone out of, almost gone out of the discourse. When, you know, even in the 1990s, every time there was a change of government, you know, people who had land used to be worried, all right, you know, is somebody talking about land reforms here? Uh, maybe there is, maybe there is a threat. Now there is absolutely no dis discussion because the elites have come together. Uh, the predation, military economy, as I argue in the book, is actually very central to that elite predation. Military economy is a form of crony capital. And it, one of its impact is that it encourages, it, is a, it's an, uh, it grows out of crony capitalism and it, you know, it, it strengthens crony capitalism. Throughout the 1990s and the 1980s and even 70s, uh, well, actually not the 1970s, because 1970s is the only period in which this economy had slowed down. Uh, probably Zulfikar Ali Bhutto understood that in order to uh, weaken the military, he had to take away their financial autonomy. 
yet you know what he did in that in 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 in, you know, in, in weakening their the economic hold he made up for it by giving them political strength uh, but throughout the 1980s and 1990s and and even now this military economy is dependent on other elite groups and other elite groups also depend on it for example when i was looking at the reactions of of uh, you know what impact it would have and i would i was going going around interviewing big business and big industrialists in pakistan on should the military be in business i was surprised that there was very little reaction from them yeah yeah, yeah you know they don't bother us there's another kada down below which you know complains about it but why are the big industrialists complaining about it the reason is that the capital that they're working with is as much of a crony capital as the military capital and they both strengthen each other you see the issue with military capital is that it's not just the economic side which is important it's the political side which is far more important it brings financial autonomy to the military having an independent i mean why would why did the military uh get into business did it have the pakistani military did not have the same reasons as the for example the indonesian military the problem with indonesian military and early on earlier on with chinese military was that they were not completely not all their operations were funded by the government so if you had to make both ends meet you had to uh, you know undertake business operations yourself fair enough pakistan government provides every for, for every, every every need of of the armed forces we we pay about 35 to 36 billion rupees every year as military pensions so there shouldn't be any complaints there as well but the issue here is that the urge for independence the urge for financial autonomy symbolically politically the military does not even want to depend on civilians for its welfare needs for its personal needs and therefore one of the impacts is on the structure of politics itself a powerful military which becomes even more powerful because of its economic strength because of its financial autonomy is then not willing to give up that power it talks about its improving its image but it does not mean business when it comes to giving up political power and there you know you can imagine uh you know in terms of of political development or future of pakistan there you can have you know all sorts of wonderful combinations uh the military does not have to be on the front seat it could be on the back seat because what it has developed since 1954 is this huge socio economic redistributive system which caters to the elite which makes sure that the elite fall uh you know uh, fall in line uh 1990s 1980s no government has ever tried to take apart the system the, this peculiar military economy which i call milbis and one of the reason is because they are in this together so once you start looking at what would pakistan's future be would it be would it be a wonderful place uh, to visit uh in the future or would it become even more dangerous as new york times claims then i think the answer lies in looking at how relationships will be managed in the country uh will the elite pakistani elite whom i think is extremely predatory and let me quickly define before i end let me quickly define what i mean by predatory it's not simple predation predation is a state in which 
the combined leadership of a country, be it political, be it military, uh, are driven by short-term gains rather than long-term objectives. And a feature of predation is that the weak are replaced by the strong and the strong by the stronger. And so therefore, there are no permanent ideologies or loyalties. And by the token of this definition, uh, if they continue to remain predatory and stop even thinking for a minute about changing the redistributive process and system, uh, you know, then I'm sure we do not, uh, nobody would have uh, a wonderful perception of where the country stands today and where will it stand tomorrow. Thank you. I'm sure that there are a lot of questions. Um, very quickly before we start the question and answer, let me make two brief announcements. I hope you all notice that there are books available at the table right over here. And also that we remind members of the Chicago Society to join us afterwards in the Coulter Lounge just down the hallway. Questions? So let me tell you that this young man from the lower middle class is pretty aware of it because the symbols of military economy are all over the place. You land at Lahore Airport. It's a fantastic airport. I mean, it's one of the examples of development in, in, in Pakistan. Beautiful airport. Spread out all around the airport are housing schemes. It's, these are all military real estate projects. You go into town and you, go to, you, you land in Karachi. Karachi is, you can call it the commercial capital of, of, of Pakistan. From the airport right into the heart of city, you, all you'll get to see is military installations on both sides. So to answer you, the low middle class young man sees it. The problem which I'm trying to point out is that this redistributive system is so skewed that he feels totally helpless. When we look at, I mean, you're looking for responses. Look at the number of young boys that you hear about who, you know, who become suicide bombers. I mean, one, one aspect of this suicide bombing is ideology. The other is the hopelessness. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that military, what I'm saying is that, you know, it's not like Burma. Military would not go, you wouldn't have military people marching and taking controls, control of things. In some cases, they would. For example, uh, I remember people from Balochistan, Quetta, telling me the story. You had whole families and they were middle class, they were not even low middle class. And they had, once upon a time, uh, bought land somewhere uh, near the provincial capital. Uh, and one day they decided to build, right? Some people, guys were retiring, they wanted to have a house. But as soon as they started building those walls, uh, there were military officers who came and tore, tore it down. Why are you doing it? This is our land. Well, because we want to build a cantonment, we want to purchase this land, but if you start constructing, the land will become expensive, we won't be able to afford it. So, you know, uh, get away. They go to the court, they get a judgment uh, in their favor, right? 
judgment uh, in which the ju judges decide on their ownership. They take the judgment. There is this guy standing there with a gun who doesn't even bother with the judgment, right? So that kind of a thing happens as well. But, you know, the military guy is not the only one doing it. You have the big landlords, you have, you know, civilians, you have other elite groups doing the same thing. And what I'm arguing here is that you have then have a socioeconomic and political system which is very top-down, which is authoritarian, uh, it, which is very elitist. So this young man does not get all those opportunities. I mean, part of the problem in Pakistan today is that the education system has broken down because, again, it suffers from elitism. What you see, the young students that you see, most of them come from this private English medium education, uh, which is elitist. The real problem, you know, you, I'm sure you've, you've, sitting in America, you've heard about the problem of madrasas in Pakistan. More than madrasas, what is problematic is the public sector education system, which does not provide this young man any social mobility. Where does he go? I'm sorry, he cannot think of borrowing money and opening a bicycle shop. Opening a bicycle shop is not very easy. They don't. They don't. Why would they? They, uh, in a way, they strengthen each other. Uh, I mean, what is war and terrorism doing today in to Pakistan? The war and terrorism is basically strengthening, you know, perhaps the uh, American Pentagon, but definitely the Pakistani GHQ. Uh, nobody else strengthens with it. And what you have in terms of these militants, they, these were all partners of the CIA and the ISI. They continue to have, have linkages. So they don't, they don't threaten each other at all. You ended your speech saying uh, the Pakistani elite are driven by short-term gains rather than long-term objectives, and that therefore they have no ideologies or loyalties. So what would you propose as a solution to this kind of system? Or if the solution is immediately available, what are the steps that could be taken to so personally, I don't have any answer. Uh, reason is that if we could have answers, I mean, one is textbook answers, you know, do this, that, or the other. For me, answer is which can work there. And nothing seems to be working. Uh, what would shake up the elite in Pakistan to say that, to see that they should allow this trickle down uh, to the masses so that it doesn't begin to stink. The system doesn't begin to stink. To that, I have no answer. Shah Hussein has stepped down as the uh, head of military. Is that a big deal? How much power did he really give up? And how does that impact Pakistan? <clears throat> he's no longer the army chief. That's the only difference. Uh, he's still arm twisting. From a theoretical perspective, actually, he hasn't lost any power, at least not much power. Reason is because he got, when he got elected president, or when he elected himself as president, uh, it was while he was in uniform. So the position of the organization, of the military, was critical in, in his uh, election. Uh, and, you know, he continues to live in the army house. It's unprecedented that, you know, an army chief has resigned, uh, retired or resigned, and yet continues to live in the army chief's house. So it means that he has those linkages. Uh, of course, he is less absolutely powerful than he used to be. Uh, I mean, earlier on, he used to wear two hats president and army chief. Now, the power of the army chief has been taken away. But it does not mean, I mean, his power will diminish only when Musharraf as a president and the new army chief come in conflict. That is when it will really reduce. What does the role of the military, the government role that it plays in Pakistan do? Negative 
I would agree, but you know, uh, the other side of the argument is that Musharraf has opened up uh, to India, or so uh, you know he claims to do. Now the thing is that military is a is an organization like any other military organization in the world, which thrives on which survives on a bogey, on a threat. You cannot have a military which does not operate. I mean, that's its mandate, isn't it? Anywhere in the world, here or there in Pakistan, anywhere in the world. So that threat has to continue. I don't have a problem if the Pakistani military say, says India is a, is a primary threat. They continue to do that. I don't have an issue with that. My problem as a Pakistani begins or my problem as a South Asian begins when this organization becomes dominant in policy making. I think this is an issue to be decided by the, by the politicians. And those who look at modern history of South Asia always forget that Pakistani politicians were always the ones on the front, you know, who kind of, uh, who began to improve relations with India. Uh, the first, uh, agreement sign, was, was signed between uh, Benazir Bhutto and, and Rajiv Gandhi in early 1990s not to strike on each other's nuclear facilities. Uh, Nawaz Sharif was signing the Lahore Declaration between uh, India and Pakistan, which would have been the turning point in, in the history of, of, uh, of this Indian subcontinent. Uh, yes, the problem is if you give uh, a military bureaucracy, the role uh, to rule the country, then it becomes very problematic and difficult to sort out relations with its neighbors. Uh, answer is very simple. Firstly, India is as much a post-colonial state as Pakistan. It's just that their problems uh, or the growth of their problems took a different trajectory. Uh, Indian civil bureaucracy is very strong, but in Pakistan's case, the political leadership completely lost control of uh, the country and the political discourse, the minute they agreed in 1947-48 to allow uh, the war to happen. And then on, Pakistan turned into a security state. Uh, and the whole nationalist agenda was then built on this one key pillar, which was, uh, you know, Pak an anti-India uh, India policy. Uh, over obsession with, with, with India. And that's where we got stuck in history. And that's where we completely lost control of the direction of, of our politics in the state. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned uh, what would happen if uh, General Kiani and Musharraf come into conflict with one another. Now, in that context, is there any significance of uh, ex service and ex generals lashing out against well, those ex-servicemen have got nothing better to do. <laughs> That's all I can say. I mean, they wrote a letter, and then you know, the next day, you know, almost half of them were denying that you know we were never we never attended the meeting, we were never part of it. Uh, it's very interesting, you know, when you come to uh, Washington and see the number of ex-servicemen who land up here. Uh, you know, trying to market Pakistan uh, to the Americans, uh, trying to get, you know, fellowships positions in the think tanks. Well, the problem is that military is a bureaucracy, and bureaucracy behaves like a bureaucracy, which basically means the new one who comes in to take control uh, is very, extremely wary of the one, uh, of his predecessor. Uh, so they're not likely to listen. 
So, you know, it's, it's, it's a good activity, uh, but I don't think there is this breakup there. Not as yet. It is not centralized. It's definitely not in the tribal areas. Uh, it is in the areas, Pakistan's main agricultural areas are Punjab and Sindh. Uh, but you'd also find land in, in the frontier province. Uh, you know, land which, is, uh, which can be tilled. So it's not in the tribal areas. That's one way of looking at, uh, you know, India-Pakistan tension. While I'm one of those who get very critical when, uh, you know, generals in Pakistan jump up and down about the India threat, I must also add that uh, India itself has contributed, all has also contributed to increasing that you know, that perception. Uh, we can be all in the Indian subcontinent be very uh, short-sighted, and that is what has happened. Mass uprising, see, mass uprising becomes a solution only when nobody is listening. And this is what has been happening for so long. I mean, I'll tell you when October 99 happened, uh, 12th October 99, when Musharraf took over. Now, before 99, most of us were of the opinion that, no, 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 no. Now, Pakistani military can just not think about taking over, right? The days are gone. October 99, military comes in again. And I had personally hoped that now the politicians will come together they will dis, you know, decide on a norm amongst themselves and tell the military that you know, next time, don't you dare come in. Uh, we'll refine our politics. We'll choose our own neutral arbiters, and you, know, you get off our back. Nothing of the sort happened. Uh, and I think, let me touch upon uh, briefly upon one of the, one of the problems. And that is that Pakistani elite is so dependent on external capital inflows that the tendency is to look outside, not inside. So even if Benazir Bhutto has to find solutions, she doesn't you know, look to the people inside. She goes to Washington, uh, which eventually can't even save her. Uh, and even after she has died, situation is pretty much same. So I don't know what, what's, what's it going to be. Pakistani people are educated. Pakistani elite is trained, educated in one of the best universities in, in the world. And yet, if they cannot make sense of this issue, that you know, do not tempt people, do not anger people, then, you know, uh, I'm sorry, nobody can tell them anything. You, know, yes. you uh, mentioned uh, briefly about uh, the October 19th, uh, what happened in Bushra's case. I have this question in my mind since then. That doesn't happen always that political leaders have created a situation which allows the army to come into power, whether it is corruption, whether it is uh, 
instability, whether it is restlessness in the society is created by a person who is elected but then he changes into a dictator and causes situations which allows the army to intervene. Like October 19, how far is it true that his plane was in the air for two and a half hours? There was no uh, uh, fuel in the plane and there were even some people in there and they, he was not allowed to land uh, and was asked to go out somewhere in India or land somewhere else, which prompted the army to take over the airports and have an army rule. So how far is that? This happened on 12th October, not 19th October. That's true. See, but the thing is that what happened on 12th, on 12th October, I'm not sympathetic with at all with what Nawaz Sharif did, right? If it was not allowing the plane to land, I'm not sympathetic with that at all. But having said that, See, the whole incident itself is reflective of the relationship between, imbalanced relationship between institutions. See, after Cargill, the, the very strong, I, I wouldn't even call it a rumor, but you know, the almost confirmed story that was going around in Islamabad was that one will get the other. Uh, you talk to the diplomatic circle, you talk to anybody in Islamabad and tell you that, yes, either Musharraf is going to get Nawaz Sharif or Nawaz Sharif will get Musharraf. And so it was a game of uh, cat and mouse being played. Constitutionally, as the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Nawaz Sharif had the authority to sack Musharraf. The question was, he did the stupid thing of holding uh, the plane in the air for too long and diverting it to all sorts of places because of the fear of the repercussion. And what he feared actually happened, ultimately happened. The two things which, I want, which, which I'm trying to say, sir, in my book as well, one is that when you look at civil military relations in Pakistan, the divide is not necessarily linear. It's not necessarily civil versus military, not simply that. It is the elite of Pakistan versus the people of Pakistan. So there's times when some, you know, when, when you know, the political leadership and the military leadership is together, and there are times when they're apart. Yes, there could be, there is also this critical uh, kind of battle which goes on for who is ultimately going to control the state. But going back to your question, I would still debate that the military as an institution had absolutely no right to come and take over the state the manner in which it did on 12th October 1999. They have always been part of the discourse, right? The first time the word troika came into Pakistani political language was in the 1990s. The troika meaning the president, the prime minister, and the army chief. They had to work together. But every time, despite that troika, they would sack civilian governments. In, in many ways, instability has been a kind of, you know, it has been encouraged. Instability is what keeps the institution strong. It's political control. I mean, being part of this troika, you could always tell your prime ministers, you know, do this or do that or I'd, I'm not happy with that. Why do you have to come and destabilize a government? Because it's not just political destability, it is destability of the country. Uh, 
question is who will do it uh, you know my issue is that once military economy grows like the way it has expanded uh, and military becomes instrumental in benefiting but also protecting elite interests because it's part of it then you know who's going to bell the cat uh, I mean, we hear about the corruption of, uh, we hear about Benazir Bhutto's corruption, we hear about Nawaz Sharif's corruption. Uh, but you know, all our lovely gen generals are almost equally corrupt. Uh, who's going to hold the other responsible? Uh, they're all in it together. So I don't see that happening. And I do not see even external forces trying to correct that balance. I, the amount of aid which comes in, I mean, during this war on terror, there have been, well, there have been $15 billion which have been given to the, to the military. There are USAID projects, there are ADB funding, uh, you know, lots of money pouring in. The consensus now is that all of it is being wasted. Uh, Half of it actually returns to you know whoever the funding nation is in in terms of in the form of consultancy fees, but whatever does remain there is either pocketed by the local consultants or uh, you know or there is corruption, and there's actually very minuscule trickle down. The question is you know nobody's willing to stop the other. Madam, uh, you're right. People retire. In fact, the bulk of the military uh, <coughs> retires when, in, you know, it, when, when they're majors, right? Firstly, let me point out that this military economy, one of, the comp one of the features of this military economy that I discuss and the way in which I discuss it in my book is that it, is, it benefits the military elite. The game begins with brigadier onwards. Once you become a two-star and a three-star, uh, life becomes even more wonderful. General Musharraf, for example, has got now got eight properties, which includes the agricultural land, which includes uh, you know uh, expensive urban properties. And I'm sure he's got one daughter whom is, he's, he's married off. He's got another son married off living somewhere in the US. General Shokat Sultan, who is director general of ISPR, once came to the editor of Newsline. Uh, <coughs> she'd published an, an article uh, by me and, and somebody else. And he was making the same argument. He was like, you know, I've got three daughters, marriageable age, blah, blah, blah. So the editor uh, <laughs> laughed, looked at him and said, look, my father had nine daughters he had to marry off. So by that standard, if marriageable uh, 
you know, daughters of marriageable age is, is the standard, then I probably my father needed more land than you. Uh, there are civil bureaucrats, there are police officers, I mean, leave, leave aside all other civil bureaucracy. We have police officers, policemen, who probably lay down their lives much more frequently every day than you'd hear uh, you know, about soldiers dying. They get the same pension. They, in fact, get much lesser pension. Let me tell you, for example, that a constable of the police who is supposed to protect you and me or whoever is there gets 3,000 rupees. 3,000 rupees is not even $100, right? And he's supposed to uh, feed his children. He's supposed to clothe his children. He's supposed to send them to school and all of that. A brigadier comes in that segment of the military organization when he can have a reasonable living. Theoretically, I do not have a problem with providing for military's welfare. All countries of the world do it. I'm not against the concept. What I'm against is allowing welfare to be used for economic predation. That oughtn't happen. What is happening in Pakistan, for example, are indirect subsidies. You see, there is state land. Why can't the state of Pakistan, if it has to sell the land, sell the land itself? The market value will be the same. You get the money, you probably fix you know, amount, give it to the generals, give it to the soldiers, give it to the officials, but then you can also have the money to spend on your development projects. Why give this one institution the authority to manipulate state assets. And I'm sure, you know, talk to an economist and they will tell you that indirect subsidies are always more expensive than direct subsidies. If, we, if there are problems indeed with, prob with, with the system of welfare in Pakistan, then it should be done in a more holistic fashion. I mean, whenever we talk to, about the military, you know, the uh, absolute need to provide welfare for them, why do we have to forget the hundreds and thousands of other people who are working for the civil bureaucracy, the 20 million landless people? There are five, there is, there is today, there is shortage of five million houses in Pakistan, right? And all you have now is all the real estate projects that are being made and military capital is playing an instrumental role in it, caters to uh, the upper middle class. What's wrong with the, the, you know, with, with the common citizen of Pakistan? Why can't we also provide for him? So to answer you, you know, uh, the upshot is make a welfare system, but let it be holistic. Let it deal with other communities, other segments of the society as well. Okay, I'm going to come to um, Two questions. Um, the second one's more of a comment that I'm going to try to weave into a question before, it's, before I stop talking. The first one is whether um, the framework of speaking of just about Pakistan and capitalism, is capitalism in Pakistan is adequate to grappling with the issues that you're raising, whether it wouldn't be make more sense to talk about the sort of broader framework of capital and the role that Pakistan plays in it. Um, that is, that perhaps it is that the world system allows for Pakistan to remain in the role of a client state, as it were. One. Two, I quite like the historical narrative that you're telling. Um, the first part I find sort of more convincing than the second, and in part um, that is about the, the role of the military shifting the role of the military through the different historical, let's say, decades of Pakistan's development. That is, that it didn't inherit a strong military through the colonial state, but one that developed in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And so the question is, um, what changed in the 70s? 
And I'm wondering whether you can't, one would have to talk about the political shift, the decline of the left in Pakistan in particular, that allowed the military to step up as an abstract capitalist in that void of a, of a left, or the co-optation by the Bhuttos and, the, and others of a populist agenda in the 70s. Right. Uh, in fact, before the talk started, I was uh, discussing this issue with uh, Atiyah, who was sitting next to you. Uh, I, 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 I didn't. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, kill him when you go home. <laughs> well, firstly, let me let me say that. I may not necessarily agree that the military was weak in 1947-48. In, in Two different things here. Infrastructure-wise, it developed during the 1950s. That's very true. Uh, 1950s, it got a lot of American aid. It had infrastructure. Uh, you know, newer aircraft, n men going to the United States for training, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 1950s, it started to uh, build institutions itself. 1950s, one other thing happened. And that one thing was indigenization of the officer cadre. 1950s, majority of the British officers were sent back. And there was <coughs> rapid promotions of junior officers who came in to fill the shoes of the senior officers who had left. Now, this happened in India as well. Uh, but, you know, India, the advantage was that, you know, the political leadership had a different vision of how they're going to manage relations, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the impact on both militaries was that their strategic thinking has always remained <laughs> substandard. I mean, I call Indian and Pakistani militaries as World War II uh, militaries. Uh, they're not modern militaries. Uh, so infrastructure-wise, there was a development, but 1950s, there was this fundamental change in the military institution, which is that they became indigenized, right? That was the one opportunity, the, the officers, these officers who were ambitious. I mean, General Ayub Khan, who was the first one to take over uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, mount the first coup in 1958, General Ayub Khan was actually, if you read at his, his, at his uh, confidential reports, he was a below average officer. Uh, he, had, uh, he had served in, in Burma, I believe, during World War II, uh, and he was given a bad report by his, uh, by his officer. And yet, he managed to make it uh, to become the army chief of Pakistan. So, you know, there was, there was a lot of things which were happening then. 1947-48, what was essential was that they didn't have the infrastructure, but they definitely had <clears throat> the mindset. See, 47-48, the military leadership and the political leadership were partners in turning Pakistan <clears throat> into a security state. Had, after fought the first war with India, 47-48, 75% of Pakistan's central government expenditure was defense dedicated. There was absolutely nothing which was actually spent on development. You know, there was then, a, you know, a consistent and a deliberate weakening of socioeconomic development or development of, 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 the, you know, of, the, of the social sector. Because, you know, 75% uh, budget is, is spent on that. So firstly, I do not necessarily link the 70s as the watershed. I see 
the development of the militaries way back 47, 48. Okay. 70s, yes, very quickly, 70s, yes, Bhutto with Bhutto with nothing to offer. Bhutto, I think 70s was when Bhutto killed the progressive left. Uh, progressive left died as well because of the, you know, of the China factor. Because China and Pakistan were such good friends, and we are communists, and the left was influenced more by China than by the Soviet Union. Therefore, there was this kind of this, this soft corner for, for the Pakistani establishment. And then, you know, Bhutto completely wiped it out. I think we're very fortunate to have such a knowledgeable speaker and such a very passionate audience. So I, what I think we can do is uh, have some snacks and be a little bit uh, less formal now, um, buy some books, and uh, please also uh, thank, thank our speaker. Too.